Welcome back to Nightcap Chat, the pop culture comics and gaming podcast. Today we are talking House of X, Powers of Ten, X-Men number one, and the future of the new X-Men franchise in the comics. I'm Blade O'Neill. And I'm Ken Brown. So I finally caught up on everything in X-Men number one. Just came out. And it was yes. a really good read. Super mind-blowing what's been going on since oh. Jonathan Hickman took on X-Men. Mm-hmm. I was just reading online here that uh, Marvel wanted this to happen back in 2015. What? And obviously, my guess, I, have to, I haven't read the article yet, but I was just going around the internet seeing what information we could find about mm-hmm. House of X, Powers of X. But my guess is because X-Men was still with Fox, they put it on hold. Yeah. And so if that's the case, then you may be seeing the establishment of a movie franchise here with House of X and Powers of X and where they're going with the Interesting. X-Men. Yeah, I mean, because we, we, we've talked about several times now that the comics are being influenced by the movies. So whatever comes out of this or gets established going forward, it's probably a safe bet that it's going to have something to do with um, with the MCU version of the X-Men, which is pretty exciting, especially since characters like Mr. Sinister are playing such a prominent role. It'll be really fun and a new fresh take uh, for the X-Men movies to have Mr. Sinister running around and he's been such a yes. big part of X-Men history. It's, it's, I mean, I'd argue it's unacceptable that we've had nothing this far besides the name Essex, I think in and after the credit scene, that's it. Yeah. He was holding the X 23 vial uh-huh. and that was about it. And they totally left that. They said, Oh, well that was touched on in uh, old man Logan. And I go, no, that no, doesn't wasn't. touch on what they were referring to back mm-hmm. in that X-Men extra credit. It, it scene. was like, they just like, Oh, this would be cool. And then they're like, eh, <laughs> let's, let's, let, let's figure out what other direction we could take this movie that no one cares about. <laughs> right, but but unless we done. start the complaining too much done. about <laughs> Fox X-Men again, because I'm already I'm sorry, getting yes, fired up. <laughs> I'm just glad that's part of the history that, yeah, we got to enjoy some great actors playing some of our favorite X-Men oh, characters. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's some things that were good and some things that were bad. But now that it's finally tied up, that uh, Marvel gets to open our eyes and open our, I guess they'll say our wallets when the movies finally come out yeah, because we're going to be right. super excited as mm-hmm. these things develop. And they're already jumping back on, you know, all the toys and merchandise. Like, yes. I mean, there's just been, I mean, X-Men have left, you know, not, not even just the comics uh, and Fantastic Four, but like toys and, and merchandise. Um, but like, there's so much X-Men and they did a whole alpha flight wave. Yes. And now one of the upcoming, uh, the sets Amazon of pops. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Alpha flight. But now they're doing this. You see the whole uh, fantastic four set for the pops. Yes, they have all like the fantastic awesome. four. They got a new doom. They got silver surfer. They got Galactus. And if they don't do a 10 inch Galactus, uh, from that set, like I'm, I'm going to be upset. Yes. Uh, cause that's like a dream pop right there. The, the cool thing about everything going on, too, like that I was thinking just popped in my head as well, is that it's the House of X is this mm-hmm. new generation of X-Men. Mm-hmm. Well, just think now that Marvel's got their fingers available with the X-Men in all formats now, mm-hmm. the nickname for Marvel is always the House of Ideas. Okay. And so now it's like, is this the first stages of them saying like that, hey, you guys, stay on board because we're going full board with X-Men now that we have complete freedom to do what I we want so. and not have it be something that gets altered by people that like the idea, but that let's take it this direction rather than the direction we truly want to take they, it. They and that's just, the beautiful thing about yeah. Disney being in control again. Yeah, they were, they were literally just making stuff up yes. in, in the Fox verse and, and the, it's unacceptable. Like some of the, some of the directors and writers, like they weren't even picking up X-Men comics. Like I, I was reading an interview the other day. I don't remember if I talked about this on the podcast or not. Like Olivia Munn was the one explaining to the director who Psylocke was and that she had a brother and what her powers were. And then the director's like, oh, really? Like, are you kidding me? Like, like Olivia Munn should not, should not be the one. Ex- like, I'm yes. really glad she did the homework. And that's great. Research if you're going to be directing and producing movies. But, and that's not that's not fair. And, no. you know, Olivia Munn, to me, was like almost perfect casting for yes. Psylocke. And like they just they failed. Um, but they don't want to read no fault to her, but that just, know? that just tells me they didn't want to, they didn't want to pay any attention to the material. Like they didn't care other than the fact this was their responsibility to make a movie about mm-hmm. this product, but they had no passion, no energy, no yep. desire to do the research, to write a good script yep. that works for what the material they're dealing with. And is. Oscar Isaac is a phenomenal actor and it's just, it's just a shame that apocalypse just did not turn out. Because yeah. I was really looking forward to that. Uh, I said too, it's like they 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 really did good casting for the X Men movies. That's one I think my highest point for the, the for X-Men the most movies. part. Yes, and you know what? If it wasn't like a complete win, it was a complete fail. Yeah. You know, like just like Halle Berry or um, 
You know, at first I was honestly on board with Jennifer Lawrence as Mystique, but it started to fall flat and yeah. hard. You well, know, they made her a lead character of the X Men. That's something that never really happened in any of the X Men storytelling at any point in history. And I said too, it's like I guess if I look at everything in a positive day with the, a positive way, of the Fox X Men universe mm-hmm. is they were trying to be an alternate reality that no mm-hmm. one's ever seen, but the characters are characters you recognize. Mm-hmm. And it's like that, hey, if I just put it in that aspect, then maybe I can enjoy that they're trying to stay within their own universe of of X-Men storytelling, but they even, you know, jer- jerked around with that, like where they gave up on their own storytelling. Yes, yeah, several. I mean, that was the problem. Multiple it was just times. like they weren't, they didn't have a plan. Mm-hmm. Like they made the first one and then they started going one way and then just things kind of, like they didn't have a plan. Yes. And I think that's been one of the biggest reasons why the MCU has been so successful because from what we can tell and what they've explained to us is that they do have a plan and that they have movies mapped out like way ahead of time. Now, does that plan change as you go along? Absolutely. And that's just production, you know, but X-Men was just like, what are we going to do now? Oh, you know, because, you know, after X-Men two, what was, what was the next movie supposed to be? They were going to do, um, a Magneto movie mm-hmm. and, oh, and the right. Xavier school for gifted youngsters. Eventually we did not get either of those things, but that de- it was evident that that definitely became what we now know as X-Men first class, because you can't tell me that that Magneto origin and that Xavier origin didn't pull from those two original scripts. Like yes. I think that was apparent. And when it's at the end of this too, speaking of losing like that mm-hmm. new mutants movie, that's done. Where is yeah, it? That's like, that's no what longer going to come out. <laughs> and you think that that was their last property that they had done. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you know, it's, it's like, did Disney take that back and say, sorry, you know what? That's part of our property now. And it's never coming out. My wife showed me an article uh, just a week or two ago. It said that the new mutants trailer turned two today. Really? It's been two years since the trailer dropped. And it was Forget supposed about. to drop in October, I think, this year. Because for Halloween, they're trying to make the kept on, or they push it, it back to next it, year. No, they, they, they delayed it again. So now it's... Is it still coming out or not? The last everyone heard it was, but it needed reshoots that still haven't happened. Wow. So nobody understands what's going on. But here's the thing. Yes. Like Macy Williams is one of the stars uh, in it, who's from uh, Game of Thrones. Okay. And she plays Wolf Spain, but like, you know, she's young. She's a yes. very young actress. Like, how different is she going to look now? You know, this isn't like somebody in their 40s. Yes. You know, like, oh, they have a few more white hairs or something. Like, you know, like once you're when you're that young, like two years is is fairly significant in like the way you look. Yes. You know? Yeah, so and and forget that. about everyone else who might be in that movie, which yeah. I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's I said too. I, I you just gonna I said it's gonna be a one and done movie anyway. They need to give it up. Just and don't so, even release it. Yeah, we don't need it. After how bad Dark Phoenix was, Do we, we don't need this X Men movie. Unless, yeah. I mean, since it's all characters we haven't seen before, unless you can salvage this as a jumping off point for the MCU, we don't need this. Yes, it's just something like that. Let the franchise die and and start over. So it kind of reminds me of the Aquaman pilot that CW <laughs> did a few years ago. It's like that the Aquaman pilot they put it on the DC Universe online app. Yeah. And I'm going, man, I heard about that, but I never thought I would see that again. Mm-hmm. And it's it's to me it's horrible that DCU is teasing DC fans with this pilot that uh-huh. didn't test well. But all these years later, I actually sit down and watch it and I'm intrigued and I want to see more. Interesting. And that was it's never going to happen. But why would you tease them? I see what you're saying. Like, why would you tease someone with setting up? And maybe that's what New Mutants was doing is they were setting up just in case Fox and Disney didn't go through. They were setting up a universe that they can continue more movies with with the young X-Men, which would have been the New Mutants. Mm -hmm. And that's probably why you're, you're probably right. We may never see it. Because it was setting up more material that they're never going to touch on again. And I, I thought I was reading that they were one of the reshoots was going to put X-23 into the movie, jumping off of Old Man Logan, which would be problematic, you know, just from, you know, the, the continuity standpoint. Yeah, is it in the future? Is it in the present? It better be in the future if they do something like that. Because it was like 10, 20 years X-23, in the future. Well, originally she was from the future and then she came back with Wolverine, I think, because she first appeared in Wolverine 
was it Wolverine and the X-Men or X-Men Evolution? X-Men Evolution, right? Yeah, the cartoon? Yeah, the okay. cartoon. Because I think she was originally a clone from the future. Okay. Right? I, I never had a chance to watch that cartoon. I'm still wanting to watch that episode because that's where she first appeared yeah. anywhere. Yeah. yeah, that's what I mean. Was in the cartoon. Yeah. I thought it was the future. I could be wrong. Because in the comic, they made her part of that NYX storyline yes. where she was just a rogue mutant that was part of like street kids that yep. never really and that was, were that was discovered by Professor yeah. X. Yeah. You see, that would be... I would love to see that movie. Like we're, we, we've talked about movies that don't need you no know, or comics that don't need movies like i think an nyx movie might be really fun i mean not immediately because yes. i i want to i want to we can have time with the x-men without wolverine then bring in wolverine that could and be then marvel's down the joker road. i mean it's an edgy movie that doesn't connect in with too much of the other marvel universe mm-hmm. but then you lay the potential for those characters yeah. like x-23 being mm-hmm. the main person that comes out of that yeah, absolutely. as your person that you bring into the x-men and it's a, it's a deep dark story and you could do something kind of like the joker but have it still work in the mcu and i think that's one of the Without getting too far off topic, one of the biggest problems with them doing this Joker movie that's really confusing that has nothing to do with anything, but then you're going to go back and reference uh, Jared Leto's Joker because you have this Harley and whatever the heck else you're you're doing with Birds of Prey over there. But anyway, uh, that's a topic for another time. Um, Yeah, but no, the the future of the X-Men... Oh, it's just so exciting it's right bright. now. And like, it's you know, that's bright. the X-Men is some of my favorite characters. You know, I love Deadpool. I love Cable. I love yes. Domino. Uh, gosh, you know, Phoenix. Like there's so many great characters. I mean, Hero Clicks doing X-Men, the animated series is hooked me back into Hero Clicks <laughs> yes. because it was playing so much to my heart and nostalgia and all of my favorite characters. Yes. You know, um, so gosh, I mean, what a what well, a time to be an X Men fan. X Men, excuse the pun, and they've hit their perfect storm <laughs> right now yes. of everything going yeah. on because it's going to be on Disney together. Plus. Yes, yeah. and it's uh, I, I'm super excited to see where they're going to take the franchise now. I mean, Jonathan Hickman is a writer that has had so much influence and good storytelling mm-hmm. in the Marvel Universe, going back to the Future Foundation, to Avengers. Mm-hmm. He was the one that set up Secret Wars yep. and wrote the Secret Wars miniseries of what mm-hmm. the Marvel Universe is now is because of Jonathan Hickman yep. and the Future Foundation of Fantastic Four and Doctor Doom being what he is now mm-hmm. is side effects of what Jonathan Hickman set up. And the X-Men here, too. It's going to be interesting to see um, what his plan is and how he ties it up. But if they can tie this up properly, he's going to lay foundation like Chris Claremont did all those years ago of just years and years and years of good X-Men storytelling. Mm-hmm. And I'm excited to see whether or not Marvel lets him do it. I don't see any reason why they won't, because I said to the future foundation, they haven't retrofitted yet. The Fantastic Four, you know, the Doctor Doom stuff. I mean, Bendis played with Doctor Doom a little bit, making him into the um was it the uh, the Iron Man, Immortal Iron Man? If I after mm. Secret Wars, and unfortunately, it's funny like that. I never thought I'd say this. I'm such a big Bendis fan, but I think Hickman leaves things in better places than Bendis does when he leaves the title. Mm-hmm. And I mean, it's a uh, you know Miles Morales they had to bring into the mainstream Marvel universe, which was you know Hickman allowing that to happen, yeah. and Bendis had to force the Ultimate Universe into the Marvel universe. But that is something where I think your two most creative minds of this era have been Bendis in the first 15 years of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And now Hickman's taking that mantle since 2010 going forward. Yeah. And this generation is like a very, very Hickman generation of Marvel we're seeing now. Yeah, after I can see set it up since I, 2000. Especially with with getting the movie rights back with of the X-Men and Fantastic Four. I think they're. They're trying to shake it up a little bit. I mean, yes. especially now with uh, Kevin Feige taking over. That's what I was just going to say. Chief now. creative officer. Like mm-hmm. they're going to talk about the, an the movies. Move. Yeah. And talk about the movies influence in the comics. Like now it's the comics. You thought it was happening before. You know? well, yeah. And it's going to be a little bit of both though too. They have to work more organically. They do. And they're, and they're, they're they accepting the fact of yes. like that. Hey dude, we have both fans going to see these movies mm-hmm. and where Fox failed is they're just trying to appeal to movie fans. Mm-hmm. They kind of forgot about how important it was to appeal to diehard comic fans. Yeah, and I think and they the were just like making movies like, oh, no, this is better than mm-hmm. than what they wrote. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, and, and Sony, luckily Sony and Marvel got everything worked out with Spider-Man. Uh, su- uh, supposedly that was thanks to uh, Tom Holland. Who, oh, really? Yeah, so I was reading that uh, uh, I think it was actually um, – I think it was Feige who said, you know, Tom Holland called him and said, Hey, you like, I really hope like you, can you please call Sony out. again to figure this out? Cause 
you know, like this, this sucks for the fans and, you know, us and, and everything like they, Tom Holland is the one who, or no, was it, I, I don't remember if it was Feige or Bob Iger now, actually. No, I think it was Bob Iger. I think okay. he called Bob Iger and yes. like, that's crazy, but yes. like it worked out, you know? Mm-hmm. And like, that's, that's so cool. And I'm so glad Tom said something to whoever it was. Cause I, I'm honestly don't, don't remember now. Um, but yes, it worked, and because it's not fair after leaving on such a cliffhanger to at least not wrap this up. And Tom Holland, I mean, his character is, they made him the linchpin of the Marvel Universe at yeah. the end of Spider-Man mm-hmm. Far From Home. I mean, they gave him the Iron Man mantle. Do you know what I mean? It's like that, hey, this is, you have the potential to be the greatest hero of this universe now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and we all know we don't want it to be pull that away from him. Is just the what? You don't want to be good? Brie Larson. Oh, yes, I'm just exactly. being a fan. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's like that. Uh, Captain Marvel, she's her own character. I give her credit for what she's doing. But sure. the, the red and blue, that's the most important linchpin in the Marvel Universe is Gosh, still Spider-Man. Yeah. Now that Captain America and Iron Man are gone. And just, I just, I just want, I want, I want to see him fight the, the Sinister Six. I want to see him get the black suit. And like, mm-hmm. there's, there's so many Spider-Man stories that I want to happen in the MCU. And, and forget about all of that. How about like the best Green Goblin we've ever had? Because yes. I mean, as great as William Defoe portrayed him, his costume just left more to be desired. Yeah, I felt like they really had too much concern of how realistic can we make this look for people that don't read comics. Yeah. And and unfortunately, that was Iron Man's greatest success and Green Goblin's greatest failure. Because the Iron Man suit did look like it walked right off the comic page. Yes. And it worked. Well, and, it was and, designed by, um, right? Um, yes, A.D. Uh, Granov, yeah. a comic book artist. Uh-huh. And with the Green Goblin suit, it's like, well, we need to make this appeal to people that would believe this would happen in reality. We can't have some guy wearing, like, you know, a mask and, like, leather out mm-hmm. there, like, flying on this glider. We have to make him look like he's military issue. And the Norman Osborn was never really, I don't think Oscorp was ever military issue weapons. I, I would argue that you could have still have done both, you yes. know, even if they did like a military issue, you could have argued that as insanity, you know, added like a goblin mask and, yes. and whatever. And I think it still could have been tactical and functional, but still had some of those, you know, comic book actors. Yeah, like that put on like some kind of tattered leather over the armor. Sure. And make it look like that you're completely crazy because technically what he was wearing was stuff that was supposed to be used by U.S. government for war tactics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and they still have, <laughs> there was still some kind of goblin looking mask. <laughs> yeah, and so, do you know, it's like that I guess could look terrorizing to, you know, other militaries when you're using yeah. it, but that's not the purpose of the Green no. Goblin. The Green Goblin supposed to so this guy's psycho not just any soldier can put this on and use it productively yeah so i mean it it fell flat and you know and then even in an amazing spider-man like they went more like that ultimate you know green goblin route with kind of like an organic kind of mutation sort Mm -hmm. of thing and i don't know and i i know that they probably did that in the ultimate universe specifically for you know, some something easy to adapt into a movie, but like I just want to. I love a classic Green Goblin, and, yes. uh, and we haven't really, we haven't got that. Yes, and hopefully Marvel can, you know, look at that and say, "Hey, this is the way we need to go mm-hmm. with it." So, uh, back to X Men. Yes. <laughs> no, dude, <laughs> um, gosh, so I think one of the the biggest things that kind of left me wondering what was going on at the end. And I've, I I did some research before we start recording this. It was like, I didn't understand what the crystal is that the scientist is going to use to bring back her husband to, yes. to life. And from what I see, like all I'm seeing is articles, like a crystal that she can use to bring back, you know, her to life. And I don't know. I just, I guess I expected it to be either the, you know, the juggernaut's crystal, like the gem of Sutterac. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I have no idea how to pronounce that. I don't think I've ever said that word out loud. Um, I was thinking it might have been the Mkron crystal going way back to Chris Claremont, John Burns, X-Men 107, actually Dave Cockerman 107, actually, mm-hmm. and John Byrne on X-Men 108 working with Chris Claremont. Yeah, that was holding of, the Phoenix Force, right? Yes, yeah. and that's something where that was a reality warping crystal. And mm-hmm. if you can warp reality to pull life out of it, maybe she's thinking that's what you know, Hickman's hinting on because the one thing I did love about what Hickman did during this story, did you see the lady that was in the test tube? The lady in the test that tube. Was the, like, which... She was like, she looked like Mr. Negative from Spider-Man, but she was a female that was all black shadowy. And she, 
that was in X-Men number one. They rescued her out of that test tube. Oh, and they, oh yeah, 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 yeah. And then okay. she just, like, disappeared. That was a reference to a Supernova storyline. That character first appeared in X-Men number 188 of okay. the second X-Men, the Jim Lee X-Men run, I like yeah. to call it. And Supernovas were the um, next step in evolution of humanity. I see. And so I don't know, you know, that's something that kind of surprised me. I was going, like, wow, it's like where's this character? Is this a new character and started doing research on it. And it, she first appeared in an X-Men book back in the early two thousands, okay. like two, maybe like 2009, 2010. It's not that early 2000, about 10 years ago. Yeah. And that's like Hickman in this house of X and powers of X. He's digging so deep into everything that's been part of X-Men history, whether you're paying attention or not, mm-hmm. everything he's doing has a purpose. Yeah. And that really fascinated me like that. Even in House of X and Powers of X, he did a lot of that. But in the first issue of X-Men, I can't wait to see who what he pulls out New Mutants, what he's going to pull out Marauders, what he's going to pull out in Excalibur. X- that X-Force. Is X-Force, that is past history that if you're paying attention, you'll recognize it. But if you're not, wait till you see the reveal. And people are going to talk about it like crazy. A little bit like what Donny Cates has been doing with Venom. Mm-hmm. And Jason Aaron's been doing with Thor. It's like we're looking at pieces of history that have never been explained and we're giving depth to them. I mean, I'm honestly, I mean, as much as I've complained about some of the things, like I honestly am getting hooked and, and like, I haven't really even been buying modern Marvel comics, but like, I really want to keep up on X-Men and I really want to see what X-Force, you know, becomes because X-Force was always some of my favorite characters and stories. Have they even announced the X Force team, or is that still? Yes, a I, I'd secret? have to have a Marvel previews in front of me. We can look okay. it up because they do have the characters on the cover. Okay, and um, like uh, with uh, the X Force, something that I haven't seen back in the picture yet mm-hmm. of Hickman's run is Phantom X. Interesting. And Phantom X was a major part of X Force storytelling during the Rick Remender run, and mm-hmm. he's the person that more or less cloned Apocalypse. And yeah. raised him as a baby. So what this whole House of X, Powers of X thing hints at hugely is the cloning process of Krakoa. Oh. And yet Phantom X wasn't brought into the story at all yet for whatever reason. And there's a lot of blacked out information of characters yes. that or story parts that Moira had in her notes or members of the different groups that run the mutantum in the public now. Is this it? Is this, is this the X Force? Yes. So, so my girl's gonna be in there. You know? Interest, interesting. Is that is that Corsair? My the issue the the one I pulled up is a little uh, blurry, so I'm tr- I can't see who's uh, next to the blue guy next to Colossus. But I mean, it looks like we got Marvel Girl, Jean Grey, Domino, uh, Colossus, Wolverine, which is fun. Um, and so it's going to be, I think there's a lot more information that we're going to see revealed as these new titles come out. Oh, here out. we go. Yeah. So Corsair, Cable, Cyclops, or no, no. Colossus. Oh, wait, that's X-Men number one. Hold on. <laughs> yes, we have Colossus. Man, come on, load up here. Buddy. Colossus, Beast, Wolverine, Domino. Um, who's this girl in the, in the black supposed to be? I'm sorry, Kid Omega. C- Celine... Oh, oh, that's from who the that Hellfire is? Okay. Club. I think is gotcha. her name. Let me see. Um, not Celine. Gosh, dude, she was a member of the Hellfire Club. I think she's part Sentinel, if I remember correctly. Interesting. I have to see here too. Let me see. Well, Domino's on the team, so I'm on board. <laughs> it's Sage. That's her name. Sage. Okay. Yes, but there is um so many little things that Hickman laid the groundwork for. Like technology is a huge, huge, huge thing Mm -hmm. that Hickman's established. Like even at number one, they had this brand new villain. Oh, man, dude, refresh me of his name. The guy that was working with the lady that's trying to bring back her husband. Oh, I, you know, that was his first appearance. I didn't catch his name, but yes, uh, he's the guy. He's the major antagonist. And he he doesn't seem to. He's blind or he doesn't have eyes or something. Yeah, that's what it was. Um. But yeah, I, <laughs> he's like the Emperor Palpatine of the yeah, story. And, I'm, like and I'm glad, and I'm glad you said his first appearance because 
I wasn't sure if he was supposed to be anybody, quite honestly, and I wasn't yes. sure if I was missing something. And maybe we will find out he's somebody down the road. It's just right Everybody now. Everybody doesn't it's have like to. You can make new characters. Like, it's okay. Yes. But, you know, like they and said, it, they've been waiting for this story, you know, like, and Chris Claremont confirmed that, you know, Marvel said, like, you cannot put new characters in X-Box because that gives movie rights to Fox. Yes. So, like, if he's a, if this new character is a big enough part of the story, like, this this is a new character. That's why he said in 2015 you know? he had the story ready exactly. to go, but it's like, yep. hey, we got to wait for this to be mm-hmm. done with with Fox mm-hmm. before we can start this. Cause yeah. this is so world breaking mm-hmm. and like progressive with X-Men. We can't let this go out the door where Fox ruins it for us to actually have it in our own movies. Yeah. Right. And have them ruin, you know, master yeah. mold, mother mold. And, and, and what was the one above that? It was like an oh, Omega. Yeah. It's like that, uh, Sentinel or something or whatever, but you know, what I'm talking yes, about the, the different levels of Sentinels, yeah, which is crazy. Yes. And that's like now like they're, 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 you know, shape shifting Sentinels were some of the last mm-hmm. things I had, like where they could take on humans, almost like scroll Sentinels in a way. Yeah. Like they, they more or less killed the, the, um, the robot sentinel kills the host and then takes on its complete mm-hmm. likeness yeah and then is you know replaces the person mm-hmm. it's, like, it's almost like a terminator <laughs> type <laughs> yes, of thing yes, to it. absolutely idea but uh yeah dude it's it's pretty intense to see where this is gonna go and then i i can't wait to see the marauder story did you hear about that whole did you read the whole the marauder story that's gonna be the hellfire club story really and the hellfire club is was put in place by professor x they showed in house of x and powers of x yeah. to broker all the trading of their drugs because and flowers you know they're 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 oh oh yeah because yeah. emma the said because well, he told emma to bring sebastian shaw in yes because he's one of the greatest business minds in mutant universe which mm-hmm. i thought was kind of interesting yeah and what i said to professor x is really trying to how would you say like it's already been established that they're trying to be their own free reigning country that you have to trade with mm-hmm. not just be given because we said to professor x said in the house of x and powers of x mm-hmm. that i've given you a lot of things for no expense because i wanted to help create yep. the harmony and you guys rejected it time after time after time so now we're still going to create all these opportunities for you but mm-hmm. now it's going to come at a cost yeah and that was like, wow. That's what I said, too. That's like, as you said earlier, is this Mr. Sinister now in control Professor X's mm-hmm. mind? But that, but that was kind of a hint. I thought I saw when he saw the grin on Professor X at points during negotiations of things. And it's like that he had a sinister smile on his face is what I thought. I go, oh, my gosh, are we going to find out that Mr. Sinister is actually such, Professor X yeah, with until, all the cloning and everything going on here? And that's yeah. all up Mr. Sinister's alley, too, as well. Yeah. But Krakoa fostering the eggs of new life. Why couldn't Mr. Sinister be Professor X's mind? But then Hickman kind of put that idea on the shelf. It felt like when Moira, Professor X read Moira's mind after we saw the missing life six and she says like that you need to change your opinion of how this is going to work because after everything I'm showing you in my head, nothing that you do is going to work at this mindset that you have right now. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's the whole thing too. We're going to find out is like that professor X couldn't change his mindset. And so Moira did her own actions, took her own actions because of everything that she's seen in every life that she's been in. That was maybe her contingency plan is like, okay, Mr. Sinister will work with me on this, but we need to work around professor X now. And maybe professor X is stuck in their own prison. Like they did with Sabretooth. Mm -hmm. Cause who knows how much foreshadowing, Hickman is done with everything that he's done in that House of X, Powers of X, putting Sabretooth in that exile because he's not appropriate mutant material for society. Yeah. You know, who's to say Professor X is not locked down in that potential I mean, mutant we'll know for exile. sure when they cut back to Sabretooth. If he was the first one, it turns out that he's and not I doubt the, he's first the first one, one. Yeah. to be put in there like, oh, what are you doing in here? You know? Yes. Like, and what, how crazy would it be like that Sinister Sabretooth says, like, that get out of my head. And it's actually Professor X down there. I, do you know what I mean? Building reinforcements of the exiled mutants that aren't going along with what Moira and Sinister are doing. I have a question. Yes. This just kind of. Very kinda deep thought, thought process yeah. on it. Well, have they established why Professor X is not in a wheelchair? No, other than the fact that Professor X in previous years, it's a state of mind. Is a uh, handicap. I don't know if that's the proper word too. Like what's PC? I'm not I, trying I don't to, know. Who cares? I'm not trying to offend anybody, <laughs> but yes, but I mean, his, his know, ability to, to walk. I mean, and at one point before this whole started, 
he's now in Phantom X's body because Phantom X gave up his body for oh, Professor Rex at a certain that's point. That's what it too. is. Yes. And that's something that I still need to read that story, but it happened over in um in X Force and X Men storyline. The um uncanny oh gosh dude the, i think it was the last uncanny x-men series before like the red and blue and all that yeah the matthew rosenberg run uh-huh. right after bendis left the book interesting and i might be wrong but definitely research my you know records on that but there was a point where professor x came back from the dead of the whole onslaught saga not the onslaught the red skull slot mm-hmm. saga where red skull put part of professor x's brain in his head well phantom x sacrificed his body for professor X's mind and let professor X's mind hop into his body, which is really, you know, I said to, I need to, I've never officially sat down and read that. But which, I think yeah. I need to read that because that's a very major, important point of X-Men history too. Maybe is that or something else happened, you yeah. know, like, I mean, at what point was it Mr. Sinister? You know, like, I don't know if there's, yeah, I was just wondering about that. Cause like but with the I, whole cloning process that. they they came up with, I mean, everybody's mind signature is mm-hmm. inside Cerebro now. Yeah. And so I'm sure Mr. Sinister, obviously everybody's in there. Mr. Sinister's mind <laughs> signature, if Mr. Sinister ever dies, they can make a new Mr. Sinister. Yeah. But they also have the DNA cloning aspect mm-hmm. part of Krakoa too. Mm-hmm. So if they could put anybody's mind in anybody's body, as long as it fits the needs of whatever they want to do with mutant. Mm-hmm. And that's the scary thing of like, they are now like they're almost gods yep. at the end of house of X and powers of X. I have a, I have and a even question. Magneto refers to that too at points. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, more than once. Yes. I believe so too. Um, one thing I kind of noticed and I was waiting for them to explain it is does Wolverine have his adamantium claws after being rebirthed from an egg? Cause that was an experiment. That's true. It's a good point too. You know, like he know. should have the bone claws if yeah. he just pops out of an egg. Do they infuse adamantium into the egg? I, <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude? I, know, it's I, just, like that. I just was waiting for the explanation on how his, how, how he gets works. his adamantium back. And when he got disintegrated by the sun, like I was wondering if Magneto was grabbing the, oh, the adamantium, adamantium and out pulling of it back or something yeah. although that is really far yeah far so i don't yeah. know how well no not just far, distance, far can he do it yeah. distance you know like can he control from that far away because i mean like we saw we i don't know if it was 616 continuity or ultimate continuity but like i think magneto can destroy the earth by throwing it off of his axis yes you know yeah. so like i mean can it go a step further Ultimatum. and pull something you know yeah exactly yes. pull it by the sun you know like that might be too far away. and since we didn't see it I don't know. I was just waiting for the explanation on how he gets his adamantium back. Yes. I don't remember Professor X was part of the storylines during, because in the Uncanny X when Matthew Rosenberg was doing, he was bringing back Cyclops and Wolverine Mm -hmm. from the dead. And I don't remember if they touched much on Professor X during that story. So we'll we'll just see what, what becomes of that. But I mean, it could very well be a hint, you know. And, uh, and I said, too, is Hickman's been pulling from everything. Yeah. That's something that, you know, I said, too, is like, who knows where, if that's what's the body that he's in right now, still Phantom X's body. Or since they've already proved that he could put his mind anywhere on his own, you know. And we know how to make the eggs and, and the whatever everything's else. in Cerebro, including Mr. Sinister's mind, mm-hmm. you could project Mr. Sinister's mind into another Professor X yeah. body. Yeah. and Because uh, it's Professor X's mind is that, you know, that strong of a mm-hmm. mutant ability. I mean, he's already put himself in other people's bodies, obviously, from the astral plane. Yeah. <laughs> brokering deals. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I want to say it was not even the first time. Yeah that he's done something like that. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, I know like that he's broken his own mind blocks of not being able to walk before. Cause Mm -hmm. that was even during the Shi'ar empire stories. No, I I remember that. Yeah. I mean, you would think that, you know, if he is such a powerful sidekick, why can he not telekinetically allow himself to stand and move his legs? Yes. You know, like, is it that exhausting when you're this high of a level of a, of a telepath? Like it doesn't seem and far-fetched that, and that was all psychological so too shadow king made him think he broke his legs and his own mind so shadow king in that original battle way back in x-men 117 was when he supposedly lost the use of his legs mm. in an astral plane fight with shadow king where he won but in his own mind it cost him something the victory 
and when he came out of the astral plane, he couldn't. He got weird. he got he got injured in the astral plane, so he believed he was injured in real life too. Huh, interesting. It's kind of weird storytelling. Yeah. That's that's Professor X though. Yeah, you know, and one thing I I had mentioned uh, before we started recording was like I don't. I don't like what they're the way he's been writing uh Mr. Sinister. Okay. And you know this this speculation that Mr. Sinister the real Mr. Sinister if you will could possibly be in Professor X's body would actually make me feel more okay about this Mr. Sinister just being a different Mr. Sinister because yeah. he's talking about like, oh, I want a cape and I'm so fabulous and this and that. He's the metrosexual just, Mr. Sinister. Yeah, it's just, it's been, I don't know, it's been weird and I, I, I've always loved Mr. Sinister and it just seems out of character in my opinion. Um, and I think they still could have done stuff like that and just maybe presented it a little differently. Um, but maybe that's why he, it's so prominent that he's acting like this because he actually is, you yes. know, in that well, in that body. There was the House of Sinister story mm-hmm. they did in the past too, where he had this castle that yeah. was just the castle of Sinister, mm-hmm. and the only other character in there was the Goblin Queen, Madeline yeah. Pryor, yeah. and that was his queen. Mm-hmm. And but he had tons of Sinister serpents yep. that were almost like a hiding in plain sight thing too, because mm-hmm. they were trying to find out who the real Sinister was when the X Men came to try to more or less attack that house of sinister. Yeah. And it was just one red herring after another of who the real Mr. Sinister could be. And that's maybe possibly what he's doing in this too. It's like that hiding in plain sight because you don't know Mr. Sinister's already perfected the cloning process. Mm-hmm. I mean, in X-Men, the end that Chris Claremont wrote back in the day, they were, he was hoping to jump into Gambit mm-hmm. and a Gambit refused <laughs> But he goes, that's what I created you for. I didn't create you just to be free willed. Mm-hmm. I created you because I knew that I could overpower you and take you as my new form. Interesting. Yeah, man, that's and right. Gambit and Rogue were married at that time and they had kids. And Gambit and Rogue were fighting Sinister from doing that. Mm-hmm. And he says, well, if it's not you, it'll be your kids then. And that was one of the major plot points. It's like they revealed that Mr. Sinister created Gambit. Mm-hmm. And the whole thing of like that. The, the firing, he's like a clone off of Cyclops. Yeah. And he genetically re-engineered Cyclops to have the power fire from his hands, not his eyes. And that's yeah. why Gambit has red eyes mm-hmm. is because it's a genetic trait I think, I think of that's Cyclops great. that's been modified yeah. by Mr. I Sinister. Totally, I totally buy that. And I think it works. And, mm-hmm. you know, that might be a fun way because I, you know, I, I can't really find it since I thought there was one version of Weapon X where like Mr. Sinister was pulling some strings. And it would be interesting to give um, you know, Gambit that origin, and and it, and it, I think it'd be cool too to not even have him know it. You know, kind of yes. like how he, you know, he wouldn't know it. You and know, you may be point. able to answer this question for me too. Uh-huh. Did Mister Sinister make the clone of Cable that is Strife? Oh, because I know Strife is a clone of Cable, and I'm yes. trying to if that was an Apocalypse created clone or if that was a Mister Sinister created clone thought it might have been apocalypse but i'm honestly not sure that's it has been a while since i since i read that and that's another precedent of mr either sinister or apocalypse mm-hmm. and plus once again apocalypse and sinister still could be working close to close because they were the ones i mean sinister owes his powers to apocalypse uh, yeah and apocalypse making that handshake with professor x just gets them in the door yes do you know what i mean and apocalypse and sister sinister may have their own plans because that, that was one of the major shocking things of house of x is even apocalypse And it was really easy and it was easy. Yes. Was like, he's in the door now Mm -hmm. and he's telling professor X everything he wants to know, but he's getting access to everything. Professor Mm -hmm. X has developed with Moira leading the way. And that was another thing. And Moira was really close with apocalypse in one of those realities she experienced. Mm -hmm. And so who's to say she didn't share all that information with apocalypse too. And Moira is truly the major queen of the chessboard Mm -hmm. in Krakoa. Yeah. In a weird way of putting everything together. So mm-hmm. even though Moira has no powers other than reincarnation, she's figured out how to manipulate every mutant on Earth. Huh. Just a thought. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's super deep. As I said, too, is Hickman setting up something that's going to be who's the true villain of the story. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to say Moira McTaggart's the true villain of the story, but she's the antihero of the story right now of like who's the person that's trying to save the world and she's got this special ability. She's going to keep on doing it until she gets it right. Yeah. At all costs. So before we wrap up then, so that's, I think that's like a question. Like, where do you think 
this might be going. I, I, I think Moira is the major manipulator of everything going on here. Uh. I mean, as the two, I just thought about that talking with you today about this, this podcast is we've already got sinister in this, mm -hmm. but she spent lives with apocalypse yeah. trying to figure out how to make the world perfect. And she knows how apocalypse thinks and she can share with apocalypse the experiences she's had as being his right hand woman, just like he's professor X's right hand mm -hmm. woman right now. Interesting. And the only way that we can make this work is you got to come to professor X and this is, as I said, too, is the, the, the major puppeteer is not Professor X. I think it's Moira. And she's puppeteering as many different people as possible with the knowledge that she's learned from her reincarnation process that she goes through and testing. She's a scientist. They've experienced already. They, they, they have uh, not only just uh, um, established inside House of X and Powers of X, but way back to Chris Claremont first creating her. She's always been the scientist the experimenter. Mm -hmm. Going way back to Moira being with Banshee, being on the island, Muir Island, her own son being Proteus and experimenting. What can I do to help out my son? She's been the experimenter since her first incar incarnation in the Marvel Universe. And Hickman, I think, is seeing that and sees the potential of you have this character that's the ultimate scientist that works with mutants. You have Mr. Sinister, who's a scientist that works with mutants. You've got Apocalypse, the first mutant, who you've, I established in my storytelling. She has worked with him super closely as the number one geneticist in the world because of experience after experience after experience of life after death after life after death. Mm -hmm. And everything stays with her. She is the ultimate source of success in her own mind of the survival of humanity and mutants together. Okay. Just a thought. Yeah, no, that's that's good. Super I, deep. <laughs> yeah, sorry. see, like I'm, I think it's gonna go a little different with Moira. I okay. think whether or not Professor X is Mister Sinister mm -hmm. or not Mister Sinister, I think she doesn't know okay. if he is or isn't. But um, it, whether she was trying to manipulate anything or not, and she may not be doing it on purpose. It's just, no, it's yes. just her information she's I think sharing. She, with she might be being manipulated, but I think she's a huge part in things getting screwed up, and she's the one who's going to have to make the sacrifice play specifically because everything is going to get so bad. Because what did Destiny say? Like you're going to live yep. ten, maybe eleven, depending on the choice you make. Now, if, you're going to sabotage yourself. But what's going to happen when she dies? We, it's going to create a new reality. So that's going to be the perfect way to let everything get so crazy that they reset again. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to be a jumping off point for the X-Men, not only in the comics, yes. but for the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it's a way of doing the origins of, of the X-Men all over again. Yes. And possibly even retelling it for an audience because maybe she realized like, you know, maybe it'll just be like, there can't be like this piece, you yeah, know, like we're, we're going to have to. Yeah. My response to life, she just jumps off. I'm just going to let things take care of themselves. Because we have to reset Because I've tried reality. over and over and over and over again. Because she messed up. You know what? I, I can't control the fate of reality. As much information and stuff I'm gifted with and things I know, I just need to live my own life like the way I started my first life. So regardless of whatever crazy stuff happens, I think Moira is going to reset this timeline. Yes. And that's that that would make the most sense, too, is like that she learns, like even in the best case scenario of everything going with all the knowledge after mm -hmm. the 10 lives, it just it's fate is fate. Yeah. Whether, whether it's Mr. Sinister it. being bad stuff, whether it's the humans doing bad stuff, whether it's apocalypse doing bad stuff, whether it's all of that. Yes. You know, cause the sentinels are coming. Like maybe, maybe that is the thing. Maybe it, it, it is this apocalypse, if you will, and that and like it's, that, it's, uh, that they are all bad. And, and that's like, what the just, future show too. It's not humans. And it's going to destroy us. Mm -hmm. It's going to be something outside of mm -hmm. earth. That's going to destroy us. It's going to be the pair of oh, the phalanx. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the hive minds. It's going to mm -hmm. be, intelligence is only so far mm -hmm. that we can comprehend as humans. And that's what powers of X was showing us is like that. We're going to keep on gathering intelligence, which what Moira mm -hmm. is sharing based mm -hmm. off of, she is the ultimate intelligence of earth and the best way to more or less. How would you say to make us safe is if you take that intelligence off the board, we don't look like a habitable thing for intelligence to take over. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Like she's, she's become the biggest threat herself. 
yep. because of all the intelligence that she's created by her multiple realities mm-hmm. of life that she's yep. seen. And that's something that's attractive to this species that's only experienced one life their whole time. Yep. And even though they're essential and eternal, they only have one life access of information. Mm-hmm. And Moira is that new information that is possibly what is worth the fight of coming to earth to take it over mm-hmm. and just make the hive mind as powers of X. That's almost like maybe what, you know, Hickman was foreshadowing in that last death is of six is that you can only go so far with this information before you're not helping the world anymore. You're becoming the threat to the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Pretty intense. I don't know. Is yeah. that what you kind of got out of that that whole thing of that information? Seemed, knowledge seemed to be the biggest threat to survival of everybody. They kept on trying to get that gathered information. Yeah, because, I mean, they, they had the whole backup thing and, like, you know, the offsite backup, you know, 8%. Like, they didn't want to give up, you know, like, the research they had. And then they, like, yeah, I mean, whatever they're doing with, like, the Sentinels and stuff, like, it's it's crazy, you know. Yeah. And, like, the humans just will not stop. And It's become Star Trek mixed with the X-Men. Sure. I mean, like, this, <laughs> everything is going to you know, come to, you know, head to head in here, obviously, you know, otherwise why are we telling the story, but just, you know, depending on how far it gets out of hand, you know, I think Moira resetting the reality is not only like the, the savior of possibly like what's happening, but, you know, just realizing that uh, this isn't, this isn't going to work, you know, like, no. you know, like this is just living in peace and harmony. Like is, it's a nice thought, but it's really not, possible with all the evil you know in the world you know you can't live in harmony with apocalypse and mr sinister and and humans and and whatever else you know here's another thing i want to visit too is like she she had that big reveal of what happened in life six Mm -hmm. so seven eight nine to the ten i gotta reread what her life experiences were in seven eight nine because right Mm -hmm. now they're in life ten correct Yes. Okay. What they revealed in Powers of X number six was ironically how, you know, how ironic is it that the sixth issue is the sixth life? I mean, Mm. Hickman thinks through so much crap. It blows my mind (laughs) that if you, you know, read between every single line that he's writing, Mm. it's all freaking symbolic. Mm. He waited to show off the sixth life of Moira from that timeline. Cause it said one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight, nine, 10 until the end of the story. And in that life she obviously gathered as much information as she possibly could so for you know seven was it seven when she's sitting on the bench with professor x or is that life 10 when she's sitting on the the, life there's too many numbers to keep track of which one was which one did wolverine stab her yeah like well that was life six when wolverine stabbed her Mm -hmm. at the end of that life but then seven eight nine but then the next thing they show is them at that mutant or the the science fair the world fair and they're sitting on the bench and they start talking to each other. Yep. And then Moira opens her mind to him for because that's happened before where they've met at that fair and mm-hmm. other lives. And then he opened up to her everything that he's wit or that she's witnessed and just had that conversation of like, well, you know, it's, it's it, my way will work. And she says, no, 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 no. Nine times. Do you know what I mean? This is not going to work the way that you want it to work. Mm -hmm. And for this to work, it's got to be, you got to let me be your co-pilot. Yeah. And that's that too. It's like, so now I want to go back and look at seven, eight, nine and see like, how did those worlds end for her after she experienced what she experienced in six and getting that far into the future Mm -hmm. where that's where she garnered the most amount of knowledge that was on that database do you know what I mean? Didn't, did, did, didn't they open all the information into her mind that they, that's the furthest that she went into the future in that, in life six. And so that she gathered as much information as she possibly could uh-huh. in life six, because that's the powers of X future. I believe is, uh-huh. is, is life six that they were hinting at in that future storytelling with the, the species coming in to try to take you know, there's there's no more future no matter what. Yeah. This species of the phalanx are coming and they're absorbing our world no matter what happens. This is the end of society as we know it. And then that's when more or less, you know, Wolverine, you know, they they, they, they knew that the information was inside of her because they transferred the information, they figured mm-hmm. it out. And the only thing they could do now was like that. He says, hey, this is how it's got to be. 
and he killed her. So she took that information into her next life. Yep. And then I want to go back and look now and say seven, eight, nine. How did those go wrong based off of that information that yeah, she gathered? There's so there's so much to, uh, to keep track of. And I was wondering yes. why my friend said so that. Go read House of X he, number three yeah. again. I was wondering why my friend said he, he read it multiple times. And I was like, why? But like after I got through it, I was like, oh, I'm, a little, yes. I'm even a little confused about some things. I don't even remember. Yeah. You know, so I think I guess, I guess you just like don't realize like what's important. You know, mm-hmm. like it's all important. There's there's so many moving parts. So it'll definitely be fun to yes. to see where this is going. Uh, but that's that's about all the time we have for today. I'm sure we will revisit you know the future of X Men, X Force, Marauders, and and whatever else is um, coming up. Uh, but you know, thank you all for liking, sharing, subscribing, and and joining us every week. Uh, you know, we're at Nightcap Chat on, on Facebook and Twitter and at Nightcap underscore chat on Instagram. We're available on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, and YouTube, wherever wherever uh, podcasts you, you can listen to uh, for free. Yeah. And uh, it's a super fun show today. I love talking X Men. As yeah. I said, too, it's like there's so much to be revealed. It's going to be a fun road along the way. I'm sure we'll touch back on this topic again yeah. as we get those reveals. And I'm super excited to do so. And I want to say thanks to everybody that, you know, comes and listens to us and spends this time with me and Blade. It's a blast doing this. And, uh, you know, uh, you can find more about us at Drawn to Comics, too. And that's on Drawn to Comics.com or Facebook or Instagram and Twitter. And uh, I don't do much with Twitter, but it, my Facebook still Twitters for me. So there if you, you uh, want to reach for me, definitely try to Facebook message me or Instagram message me, and that'll be the quickest way to get a hold of us. And keep loving comics and anything pop culture, and we'll keep being here for you. So, Ken, next week we are going to have a Halloween episode. Yes. So uh, what you have some things going on at Drona Comics this know, weekend, I is, understand. It is that time of year. October 26th is this Saturday. And um, from we're going to be open from 11 a.m. to 8 p.m. at the store. But from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m., we are also doing our Halloween Comic Fest event with the library, too, as Fun. well. So we'll have local artists. We're going to have free comics. We're going to have Phoebe Marlowe, who's like a local singer, doing some school scary tunes that she'll be doing, mm-hmm. singing in the library. And also we're going to have DJ Fusion. Ish Marquez will be inside of the store DJing for us. So it's a... Costume party, come hang out in your costumes if you like. There's going to be free candy. There's going to be free comics. It is going to be a blast as always. So we encourage you checking it out and look forward to seeing you all there. Yep. I will catch you all next week with our Halloween episode. So stay tuned for that. (laughs) Thank you all for listening. Thank you.